Hello, my name is Joe Barnard. I have a very ambitious project coming up and I need to build a test stand for it. So let's get started right now. Sorry, neighbors. To build this test stand, I'll be using 8020 T-slot aluminum. 8020 is awesome. It's like Legos, but way stronger and more expensive. All these pieces of aluminum get linked together by small brackets. So let's go over how all this stuff gets connected. We'll use these brackets to link the aluminum segments together. This works by using two screws per side of each bracket. The screws go into threaded plates around the back, and those plates go into the T-slots of the aluminum segments. Then the screws get tightened down and the parts are secured. I could absolutely build this out of simpler materials, but I really like overbuilding things. So we'll build this whole thing as a box. The device being fired goes in the center and we'll place extensions around each side to anchor it down if we need it down the line. For most motors, I'll fire them directly upward out of the stand. You could absolutely fire them in different directions like sideways or down, and there are trade-offs to each one of those approaches, but I like it when things go up. I mentioned it before, but this test stand is way overbuilt. My goal is to have it last for a long time, and while that 8020 aluminum isn't cheap, it can all be taken apart and used for future projects if needed. Now, I usually 3D print the parts for most of my projects, but today I'd like to try something new and a little different. 3D printing is considered additive manufacturing. You add material as the part gets built up. But today we'll be doing subtractive manufacturing, which as you might guess, involves starting from a piece of stock material and then subtracting parts away until we just have the desired pieces we need. Here are the parts I'd like to make. These little brackets on the test stand sustain quite a bit of force, so metal is a good choice to work with here. I'd like to give a huge thanks to Carbide3D for sending me their Nomad 883 Pro CNC. This is not a sponsored video, they didn't ask me to say anything, but it's important to be transparent here, and that kind of thing does have some influence. Before we get to that sweet, sweet CNC footage, let's talk about tool paths. Tool paths tell your machine where it needs to move and what it needs to do. I used Fusion 360 to generate the tool paths for this machine, and we'll start out with a facing operation. This will tell our machine to grind down a flat surface on the top of our workpiece. This is usually a great place to start with tool paths. My workpiece was just a little bit taller than the brackets I needed to build, so we wanted to grind it down a bit. After the facing operation, it was time to carve out the brackets, and for this we'll use a contour operation. This will etch out the sides of the part super efficiently, just leaving the brackets without any extra cutting needed. So we haven't actually cut through the aluminum, but we have made a ton of progress in getting there. And so I think I can probably finish up the rest of this by hand. Which is exactly what I did. I used pliers to remove the final bits of aluminum and then a file to grind down the sharp edges. You can also see the difference between the surface finish on the top and bottom of the part. So after getting the brackets all cleaned up, it was time to load them back into the CNC machine and bore out some holes so we can connect them to each other. Thank you. 
That was too fast. This was my first time machining anything. Are you able to tell? Oof. Getting these parts done was a huge learning process for me and a ton of work. I don't care that they're not perfect. I don't care that they're literally rough around the edges. It was the first thing I machined and I'm proud of it. And you can't tell me what to do. You can, but I'm a very bad listener. With these brackets done, it's time to install the load cell. And these things are so, so cool. So while that's getting done, let's go ahead and talk about how load cells actually work. Bear with me here, but this is a ruler. If I take this ruler, push down on one side, and let it go, it wants to spring back up. And that's because the top of this ruler is in tension and the bottom is in compression, which is to say, the top side gets stretched out and the bottom side gets <laughs> scrooched together like that. It makes that noise. It, do it doesn't make that noise. This is the load cell we'll be using. We'll attach it to the test stand using the brackets we just made, and once mounted, it'll work the same way as that ruler. Even though it's almost impossible to see from this camera angle, when I push down on this side of the metal load cell, the top half gets pulled apart just like the ruler, and the bottom half gets <laughs> scrunched together. So how can we use this tension and compression to our advantage and actually measure the load? Well, load cells have small sensors called strain gauges on the top and bottom of the load cell. These gauges are very thin but long runs of wire that use something called the piezo-resistive effect to sense when they're being stretched apart or pushed together. Which is to say that when they're stretched apart or pushed together, they change their electrical resistance. The signals coming out of those strain gauges are actually quite weak though, so after going through a little bit of circuitry, they go into an amplifier, which amplifies it! And then they can go into a computer, which lets us read the load cell. And so with all that covered, let's give it a test. This fan is part of a new project called Sprite, which is a hopper slash lander vehicle, and I'll give you some more details on that in the coming weeks. You can see that as we step through this data, the fan changes speed as we increase power from the flight computer. I'm also logging temperature, pressure, voltage, and a bunch of other metrics. This computer has plenty of inputs for even more sensors. Again, this test stand is built for expansion. Okay, cool down. Also, shout out to being safe, got the safety glasses and the headphones. Hi everyone. So we built the test stand, it obviously works, but if it doesn't have LEDs, is it really science? No, of course not. Let's fix that. I designed these boards like two years ago for my regular launch pad. They each have a tiny red and white LED on them. So to start off, we need some solder paste. The good news is that this solder paste expires on, uh, what does it, what does it say there? Kind of hard to read. Ah, there it is, right at the end of 2019, so it is okay to use. These boards are actually kind of a terrible design. I ended up having to mount one of the LEDs at an angle. Honestly, some things are just not worth fixing. The final step here is to solder on the terminal blocks and then repeat the process a few times for the other LED boards. And once mounted on a little 3D printed stand, I put an LED board at each corner of the test stand and wired them up. This is a rocketry YouTube channel. I mean, come on, you saw the thumbnail, you know what's coming. I think it would be a criminal offense for me to not fire a rocket motor in this test stand we just built. So let's do that. I'll start out with the F23-4FJ rocket motor from Aerotech.
This motor has a super nice smoky burn and it just looks awesome. I ended up firing two of these motors on the day of testing so I could compare the results between them. It's super interesting to compare the different shapes of the thrust curve here. It's also worth noting here that because we're firing this rocket motor directly upward, we get a little bit of discrepancy from the mass of the propellant being lost after the test. That can be accounted for mathematically or just by changing the setup to fire to the side. So then to finish it off, I fired an old Estes E9 rocket motor. I love these black powder motors. I know they're not as efficient as ammonium perchlorate or energy dense, but they look so cool and the sparks that they shoot out are awesome. If you want to check out the solid motor testing data from today's video, that is linked for free in the description down below. And if you want access to the testing footage, that's over on the BPS Patreon where I post more frequent behind the scenes stuff. So thank you very much for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.